Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about Blender installations and what it's like as an add-on developer kind of working with Blender. This comes after I made a funny post on social media. Just to show it quickly, it was this one a little while ago. Oh shit, here we go again, showing the different Blender versions in the taskbar. Now obviously it's just a joke one, but it's quite funny. You know, you get a lot of people saying, use Blender Launcher, use Steam Installer. Some people saying, oh, me too, me too, I've got all these versions. But some people got like really kind of defensive, like, oh, why don't you just use the launcher? Why don't you just set that or the other? Now, it's been like a week or two since then. And I, I just got a quote tweet from someone saying, just found out with horror that nobody seems to know you can simply install Blender on Steam and have it auto update like a game. So I got a little bit annoyed and I said, bro, I'm an add-on developer. I have different versions of Blender to test different add-on versions. Some are in portable user data mode, some aren't, some are installed, some are zipped, some are local, some are remote, some have add-ons linked for VS Code extension and some don't. So it seems that some people are under the impression that every Every single Blender woe can be solved with a simple tool or by doing something extremely basic like just updating from Steam. So everything we're going to talk about is not even considering building Blender which is its whole other thing that I'm not even involved in. But I'll just explain my process because you might find it interesting. When I install Blender, I do it by zip rather than installing it directly for an installer through Windows. So basically Blender is never installed for me. The reason is because there are often mismatches on Windows. It gets confused when trying to like assign Blend files to the Blender software. I've had it so many times in the past when even when like reinstalling Blender properly and trying to manually reassign the file type to the new executable, it doesn't get it. It just gets confused all the time. Blend files never open in Blender. I always just install by zip. Sometimes those zip files are on a separate drive. Sometimes they're actually on the computer. Sometimes the Blender is using the app data, so user preferences for you know your C, Windows, whatever. Sometimes it's in portable mode. If you don't know what portable mode is, when you have the executable for Blender, you can put a portable folder, and instead of reading add-on data from the user preferences on your system, it will read it from the portable space. And what that does is it makes the Blender installation more movable. So instead of having to like copy data from two spaces, your user data and the actual Blender data space, you can have it all just relative like to one folder. And then that is an installation of Blender you can move on to different drives. So say you were working in a team environment, people could access that entire system, including all the user data add-ons and configs and stuff like that from a single space on a separate drive. There is no guarantee that every single updating tool knows that portable mode exists. And of course, typically if you're installing for an automated system like Steam or something like that, it's just going to go for the default user preferences thing unless you make it portable in the Blender data afterwards. Did you know that by default Blender actually reads add-ons from two locations? There may be more than two locations but have you ever thought about you know how Blender would often come with default add-ons packed in that you can enable and disable? Actually I don't know if it still does since the extensions platform so this information might be a bit out of date. Did you ever ask yourself where those add-ons actually were? Do you remember you could enable like loop tools and bool tool? They were just their optional things to turn on. In the actual Blender data like the software package data, there was already like a config and script data area that's reminiscent of the user data, but it would just store those pre-packaged add-ons, which you could turn on and off. So you had this kind of mirroring system where the user data was kept separate, which is where people usually install add-ons, and the Blender data was there, which had the pre-packaged things. Now, when it comes to testing add-ons, sometimes I have used Blender in user data mode, where it's kind of separate, and sometimes I've used it in portable mode. And really, in the end, I've gone back and forth on it, but I kind of just figure, well, user data mode seems a bit easier. Now, when it comes to actually making add-ons, I use Visual Studio Code with an extension written by Jax Luke, who is a Blender developer on the Blender team. It's a really good extension. What it does is when you're writing the code, you can link it up to a Blender executable. It will then look at the user data for that installation. It will then make a shortcut, so not copy the folder. It will make a shortcut of the add-on folder you're working in and then place that in the user data so that Blender thinks by some kind of illusion that it's got the add-on installed when it does doesn't. It's actually just shortcutting it to your workspace. I'm just realizing when editing this video in some weird way, I don't actually have either Blender or my add-ons installed while developing them. Because, you know, there was no installer used for Blender. It's just kind of suspended in a different drive. And for the add-ons, they're just pretending to be installed for Blender. It's like having the entire system on some kind of bypass. Anyway, I'll carry on. Now, I don't know whether that add-on, or I can't remember whether that add-on supports 
portable mode, or whether in portable mode it would just try to look for the user preferences. That might have been one of the reasons why I just swapped back to user preferences. So one thing I want you to keep in mind is that I've got a workflow that works, but when we're looking at other softwares, so say I wanted to just rely on Steam to update my Blender. Well, if Blender updates, does it overwrite the previous versions so I can no longer test them? Well, that won't be any good. Is anything going to get confused when I'm running an add-on made by one person, but managing the software made by another person, and then writing those Animals made by a third person. Like every single point in a chain in a development pipeline opens up new possible problems whenever another tool is added that needs to be maintained by someone else. So, especially from a development workflow, if you as the developer understand this chain of actions, things where they exist and what needs to happen specifically, and then someone else looks at it and goes, Oh, just use this updater. It's like, okay, I know you, you get that you're probably trying to be helpful or smart or whatever, but that's not realistic, especially if we then need to try and replicate issues that are presented by specific users of specific add-ons. Say someone does have a certain configuration. Maybe they are directing their Blender to use add-ons in a config system that's on a separate drive, again, like a team workspace, something like that. There are often problems which are like system dependent, which are really hard to pin down, but they are often based around file management and directories. For example, if we are writing, I'll take the example of Biogen, it's got a content pack system. The way you write directories does not comply with every operating system. So a lot of things you write for will work on every system. It's kind of the nice thing about the Blender Python API is you can be assured if you call something, it's going to pretty much work the same for everyone. But as soon as you get down to a system level, like concatenating a directory, when it comes to reading the directory, problems can occur. And especially things like reading the file space. So if you're reading like every file in a folder, sometimes there are hidden things like with Mac, there's the .ds underscore store files, which in some cases, I've had this problem, Python doesn't always know whether to regard it as a file or a directory, which is a really weird problem. And I'm sure there'll be developers going, wait, what are you talking about? Of course that doesn't happen. It does. We had a really weird problem with that. Again, it depends how you write things. So the point is, as a developer, I like to keep multiple raw Blender versions uninterrupted by external third party tools because I already know how the software works. I know exactly where each of those versions has their files. I know exactly where they're looking without anything else interrupting that process, not changing the versions without me knowing about it, such as like with an auto updater, not storing extra data about them somewhere else for like a third party tool. And I'm sure it won't be the case with just Blender, but if you are developing for something, you like to be boots on the ground, hands on the weeds because you know the process and you have a workflow and it works. So obviously things get even more complex than that. Like I said, I haven't even talked about building Blender, which I don't do and I may never do. Ben has started doing that because obviously he started contributing some nodes for geometry nodes. And maybe I'll show you something quickly like from a natural workspace. So when it comes to Python and Blender, I typically look at stuff like this. So I'm in Visual Studio Code. I've got all different subsections of code split into different regions, right? So we're looking at class for an operation for importing a type of mesh effect. This is in Bygen. What I do is I make changes. I press Control Shift P, go to Blender, Build and Start. This is provided by the Jax Luke extension. See that I've got a few executables here, selectable. They're not always the proper release ones. See, this is a release candidate, but this one is not. So we've got three, four, and five at the moment. I can choose to add a new one. Notice that the actual Blender version is not even stored on the C drive. So this is stored on an external drive. I have a folder specifically for Blender versions. So I'd select the most recent one, 4.5, and it's going to start linking up the workspace with the Blender instance. Now what happens is we've opened and Biogen, which is in development version 10, by the way, is now linked up to this workspace. Any change I make here, say I'll do some typing, add some debug function, whatever, I'll press Control Shift P again, and then Blender reload add-ons. And what that does is because it's linked up to this active executable of Blender, it will then update the Python there. So then without needing to close and reopen Blender, I can just try a function again, and then I will see a result in VS Code. Notice that we have this color down here on this bottom bar basically indicating that we are currently linked up to Blender. If I went back to Blender and then closed it, we will see that color bar disappear. So the point of just showing you this is that it's not the case that we can be ambiguous and just use any auto updated version. We are specifically focusing on specific executables while working on add-ons. If I was then in the workspace for something earlier, I'd go back into Visual Studio Code. But when I did that process to build and start Blender, I would choose Blender 4.4 instead of 4.5, for example, and then it would open that executable instead. So you notice that at that point, I have a choice in my own built list 
for executables to run. So say I was using something like Steam, and if it was just overwriting the versions, when I come to choose the executable, there won't be anything there. Or maybe when it tries to run it, there'll be an error because nothing exists. Again, the Blender launcher could work with that, right? Just by installing them, I'd have to find them, add the executables. But like at that point, what's the point? It's already so easy to download Blender from the website. I just download it straight into my own folder where I keep all of them. Why do I need a launcher for anything. It'd just be another kind of pointless thing for me to have. My Blender launcher is my Blender folder where I just have all the different versions. So anyway, maybe you learned something, maybe you didn't. The bottom line is when it comes to developing, it's nice to have your hands on like different versions so you can differentially compare like the different add-on versions to the different Blender versions. Likewise, you can run Blender in different modes depending on how you've got it set up. I like to keep all the versions that I'm focused on in one kind of unified Blender folder and then I'll have them selectable for my Visual Studio code workspace and sometimes like I kind of alluded to I'll just go back and forth between having them in a portable mode or just the traditional user data mode and I don't need anything else why would I if you made it this far through the video put a let's do a gear emoji since we're sort of talking about tools development and stuff if you put that in the comments I'll see if you made it this far I'm obviously going to get back to working on the tools for you now again if you want to help increase the wage that contributes to working on the free tools you can sign up to the patreon otherwise have a great day everyone and I'll see you next time